Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, we're here to talk really about uh, how do we make sure that we get from employment, uh, from education really, to employment. When I look at life as Manpower Group, we talk about four elements of what we call the human age, four megatrends as we might describe them. One of those is around demographics, and I'm sure that's going to come up today. Uh, different aging of workforces uh, in different parts of the, the, the globe as well. We talk about technology and how technology is changing jobs in the world, uh, how it's moving jobs around and helping people to move around the world as well. Another topic I'm sure will come up today is about individual choice. When we look at the workforce today as Manpower Group, we talk about those with skills, with talents, and we talk about them having choice. We talk about them deciding where they work, when they work, how they work, and I would hope that that comes up today in some of these discussions. And the last thing we talk about is our clients, where our clients are really looking um, to decide where do they move their workforce to gain productivity gains or efficiency gains, uh, or indeed to go in search of talent to ensure that their business, our client's business, is really winning in this changing world of work. But I asked the question today, and uh, we'll get into some discussions here, I hope today anyway, whose responsibility is it to make sure that we're training people, we're training the workforce, to ensure that they're ready to go into employment, and what indeed does employment look like? Is it government's responsibility? Is it educators' responsibility? Is it businesses' responsibility? Or do we put that onus back onto the individual for them to make sure that they're getting reskilled constantly in an ever learning uh, environment that we're in? And I'm going to kick off with my great panel that I've got here today. I'm going to kick off with Daniela. Uh, and really, Angela, if, if I talk about whose responsibility do you see it as, what, what would your answer be on that? I think, Mark, that it's definitely a shared responsibility. And in that part of the shared responsibility, I would like to address what I think is the responsibility of organizations. If we step back and we look um, just 15 years ago, what workforce meant and how workforce was being considered, it was a fairly constant variable. People that were in the office from nine to five, having very linear career trajectories at predetermined promotion rhythms. And as we were moving up to the organization, uh, people were mostly able-bodied, mostly white, and mostly male. In 15 to 20 years, that reality has dramatically changed. Men and women work and live differently. However, the structures in the organizations are still very much in line with that old linear career trajectory type of model. So we are now in, in, in a situation where there is a real gap in between the needs of the workforce, what it means to have a compelling employer value proposition, and the skills of those who manage these people. So from our perspective, Managing diversity, diversity in terms of gender, in terms of different attitudes towards risk, in terms of how we manage our career and we manage the other's career in different ways, it is a skill and a competence that needs to be trained. And somehow, we train people on putting together financial statements, strategies, uh, marketing uh, offers, but we do not train people in how to deal with people that are different than ourselves. And as the experience has shown, the more, the more diverse this workforce became, the most, a more uneven the playing field got. Not because of the fact that diversity is not a driver of success, it is, but because of the way we treat people that are different than ourselves. So from my perspective, this is a critical skill and competence mm -hmm. that needs to be trained. And uh, one of the, uh, the very interesting ways in which we have seen some organizations training this, this, this competence is to say, well, whoever is on a succession planning, whoever aspires to be a business leader in the organization needs to spend at least two years at some point in their career dealing with talent management issues, day in and day out, and to acquire those skills and competencies of ensuring that this diversity does translate into productivity, creativity, intelligence, and business success. 
So, so, so what I'm picking up there is, is the responsibility for business. I'm going to turn to Nancy now at EY because you must see this uh, dramatically in your business. The change that you must have gone through at EY to make sure that business is responding to this must be, must be quite large. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're responding to a lot of things. Uh, we're responding to not having supply of people um, coming out of universities or in the marketplace to, to meet all the needs we, we have. Um, so we, we have to decide, do we, do we get what we can and then develop um, or make do mm -hmm. without? We have um, our needs of our business keep changing. So if somebody is perfectly competent today, the skills that they need in one or two or five years are changing rapidly. Uh, where the work is um, around the world, we have different markets growing at very, very different paces. Mm -hmm. and the education systems haven't quite caught up to that, so we have issues there. And we have issues um, on just attracting uh, people to, to big businesses and multinational businesses in certain locations where there might be more um, local sentiment or, um, or kids just don't necessarily want to come into a big organization. So we've had to adapt a lot. We've had to change ourselves um, into more of a experience organization. Um, it's very much about making sure people get a lot of different experiences so mm -hmm. that they want to be with us and that they're developing mm -hmm. different skills along the way because it's not all about classroom learning at all. We've had to be in, in middle school and high school, secondary schools. So we're starting to deal with students when they're 12 and 13 and 14 years old to talk about what a career in business can be and, and why they would think about that and what education classes they would um, start to, to take to prepare themselves. We are, um, we've become more purpose driven. Uh, we have a purpose building a better working world and we think that's very, very important so that students want to join us and, and, and others want to join us. So it's been a whole bunch of different things. At the same time, we feel a tremendous responsibility to be in the communities helping, helping to steer um, young people to what will get them jobs. We look at the, the the young um, joblessness, unemployment rate, and say something's got to change. So we have a lot of mentoring programs all around the world to get to students and children when they're young. You know, if, if they can't read in, in mm -hmm. third grade, they're never going to graduate from high school. So how do we help them to read in third grade? How do we help them to want to um, progress? We're in the high schools helping them to apply to university. So it's a, it's a lot of things, and it's a mosaic, and we have a huge responsibility um, Huge responsibility to coordinate with the students, with their parents, with government, and with education facilities, education institutions, to make sure we're, we're addressing these issues. Thank, thanks, Nancy. Tim, from your perspective, from the Apollo Group, if you think about um, what Nancy's saying here, but going into the youth at uh, 13, 12, 13 year olds, is that the place to go? Well, I, I speak for BPP University, which is the university I, I represent, and um, I think there's, there's a range of ways in which universities can respond to these problems. I think for us as a new university, the key thing that we had the luxury was to not inherit the old systems of how things have operated and try to define a university for the future. And we are unreservedly a university for employers and for the professions, and I think the key responsibility that I have is to listen to what sort of skills and needs are required um, in the future and to then do what I can do to build the curriculum that meet those needs. Now that may sound like a very obvious thing, but that is not typical of what universities do. Mm -hmm. Historically, universities have been set up um, to support the individual research careers of academics and students are put around the edges of that model. <laughs> that has to change and that's something that we're looking to do Obviously, there is a role for everybody within this system to look um, at, at younger age groups and what can be done to um, work with the school system to improve those transitions and so on. Um, but certainly for me, as a university, I think my primary responsibility is to be very clear about what employers are looking for from graduates and to direct my attention at making that better. But Tim, do employers know what they want? Can they predict what they're going to need in three years' time, five well, years' time or ten? I, I agree with that, and I think that is one of the concerns, that, that business can be very, very short-term, and it can be very aware of its very immediate issues. Of the megatrends that you talked about in your, in your opening, I think the story of our age is technology, and I think technology and automation 
are changing the world. I think over a 10 to 20 year period, um, many have predicted that 50% of the roles in society and business will be gone. There may be many more that we can't imagine at the moment, but it is an enormous disruption. And you're absolutely right that when you talk to a busy executive right now with his head down trying to deal with this quarter's problems, he won't necessarily articulate the needs 10, 20 years out. Mm -hmm. So you're right, we need to be very mindful of that longer term dimension. My concern is that universities have always used that excuse to go and do whatever they like. So you have to get the balance right between being really, really relevant to the now because they're going to get the job now and they need to make an impact today. But you also need to think about, well, how do we create the skills that will enable them to relearn and be successful over 10, 20, 30 years? Nancy looks like she wants to jump in there. No? Well, I don't want to steal the time, but something you said um, just sparked me. We also, in business, we need to understand the students and how smart they are now and what they're learning and how they communicate differently and their knowledge of technology and figure out how we change our business to take advantage of their skills. So it shouldn't all be business saying, these are the skills I want, train up for them. It should be, what do they have? How do we team together to make our business work better? And, and the kids today are, they're just so good. They're so good. You haven't met my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you I like them. <laughs> Maeve, I know you look at uh, Future Foundation, you, look, you do look forward on these things, and you look at the history and the trends of things. Where do you think we're going? And who do you hold responsible for making sure that we, we begin to find this talent and, and skill people up uh, in time? Um, well, I'll start with the stepping back before looking forward uh, scenario. I think the uh, world of work in terms of what we want as people, as humans, as employees has dramatically changed in terms of what it represents for us. It still represents a salary at the end of the day um, and it's the second most important thing about having a job is how much I take home. But actually the most important thing about having a job these days is doing a job that I enjoy. Um, and the vast majority of people will also agree very highly with, you know, what really motivates me is doing something I'm inspired by. Um, and it strongly, strongly correlates with um, our desire for new skills. So what we see is highly motivated, um, highly uh, qualified, to Nancy's point, extremely able uh, workforce but um, that sometimes um, losing out in terms of being able, getting that sense that they can consistently build on uh, skill acquisition and that this will propel, if you like, their, their motivations and their desire to be the best employee that they can be. And work today really represents for people their very self-identity. You know, work is essentially who we are and who we want to be. We were talking in the corridors about how much it needs to represent your optimal self so I think, you know, we can tap into those desires, those motivations. And I think, you know, if I project that forward, I think, you know, automatically, if we, if any of us could hear the conversation at lunchtime, there was a brief reference to the robots coming and uh, the world of Depop where, you know, that. yeah, the, the, the scary bit where <laughs> essentially all of us in, in white collar jobs are, are, are essentially going to be automated. But, you know, I think a, a lot of uh, what people are looking for are actually the intangible skills. So. When we look at what employers are finding, we can see that actually a lot of the time, not to, to undermine Nancy's point, I think there is a massive gap in terms of finding all the talent you need, but you know, a lot of us are technically skilled. We are trained to do high performing jobs. And actually what we want to do are learn things like uh, calligraphy and how to code and how to be more emotionally convincing in the workplace and, and softer skills. And I don't think we invest in those things nearly as much as we should. Um, and I think, uh, strangely enough, those things correlate to a more strongly uh, motivated workforce, a more able, uh, a more uh, networked set of, of individuals who then go on to recommend other jobs to other people, uh, uh, just a more connected workforce more broadly. So things that I see coming from the future will be the importance of networks and of skill-based networks. Um, the intangible skills, you know, how to be more um, uh, self-aware, convincing, confident, um, how to access a whole set of um, uh, different types of skills, how to almost be a leisure learner in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that actually makes you better at the day job as well. Um, and in terms of responsibility, 
Um, I actually think the responsibility, uh, apart from a you know, huge exception, anyone, there are a lot of people who are vulnerable, shall we say, who have not had access to all the right things, but I actually leave the responsibility with the individual. Um, and I think, you know, structurally, to come back to some of the things that Aniela was saying, you know, s some of that is an issue, particularly when you're uh, looking at gender imbalances, um, particularly women later in their careers, um, more so actually than at the start. Um, but, but I think ultimately, you know, we are all incredibly motivated, incredibly um, interested in our careers. And I think if we, in instead of, we talked about it earlier, um, wanting to run off and set up our own businesses and, and chase after the entrepreneurial dream, which believe it or not, half of this room apparently wants to do, one and two of us wants to set up our own business, actually invest that energy back in the workforce where it's entirely more realistic and embrace a, a, a set of skills that's actually beneficial for all. I'll, I'll shut up now because I've answered about 50 questions and probably not the one you asked me in the first place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Richard, let me try and bring, bring you in here. What, in your busy career that you've had, what do you see about um... busy career? That he means he means in that in that <laughs> career in which you couldn't decide what you wanted to do <laughs> at any point in your life. <laughs> From the legal perspective, then, um, and working in New York, I mean, it's so busy again. Uh, the workforce in New York constantly changing and moving again. What do you see? Because you're seeing professionals that coming for extra coaching and mentoring yeah. in your organization. Mm -hmm. what, what are they looking for? Well, I loved what you said about networks, you know, and that is right in our sweet spot because um, I think that um, these, these, network, these networks of expertise um, is going to be very important in terms of training people who are already in the workforce. And uh, whether it's apprenticeships or peer-to-peer -peer learning, which uh, we think at, uh, at GLG, at Gerson Lehrman Group, where I work in New York, but we're everywhere. We have a big office here in, in London. Uh, you know, we really see peer-to-peer -peer learning at, uh, as the future, being able to call on people at any point in your career, uh, either within networks uh, in, your, in your own company or to reach out and to open source networks for expertise. That that is the, that is the key to success for the modern professional, but, but also, you know, you see it in all kinds of areas. So I loved what you said about networks, but, but more broadly, um, I, I, I mean, I think that you saw in the answers that people gave the range, the, the incredible diversity and range of issues that are encompassed by this topic. I mean, you could certainly do a whole conference just on this topic rather sure. than just a panel. And um, uh, I liked your first question very much. I mean, whose responsibility is it? I definitely agree with you that I think it's a shared responsibility. I think, you know, I have a background in, in, in government uh, before I was in the, in the private sector. And I think government has a huge role to play in this. Um, uh, and when I was trying to, um, but of course, companies have a big role to play in it too. And when, when I was trying to think about a structure uh, to, in which to think about all these problems, I, 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 I found myself repeatedly asking, me the same, asking myself the same three questions, and that is, you know, are, the first one being, are we teaching the right things? Uh, I think there's certainly a lot of issues in, around that. We certainly have to teach more technology, right? And, and we have to teach it in a way uh, that uh, allows for, uh, you know, more vocational education and more apprenticeships. But if you see the first question as, are we teaching the right thing, th things? And then the second question really being, um, are we, in some instances, teaching nothing to, to, to certain people? In other words, are people going through school and really learning nothing? This is a huge problem in the United States where, where uh, I'm on the board of, uh, of the State University of New York, which is the largest <coughs> university in the, in the United States. We have um, f almost 500,000, 500, almost half a million students in 64 campuses. And we see people coming out of, out of our high school, especially coming into our community colleges, who are really not equipped to go to college. So we're sending them to college because we have a culture in the United States which says you must go to college in order to succeed, but we haven't prepared them in any way for college. So I, I put under that rubric, you know, things in, in kind of the second category. Are we teaching some people nothing that they need to succeed? And, and then, the, you know, the, the question that a number of people alluded to, uh, the third question being, 
Um, in, in an era of globalization, in this era where technology is really driving everything, have we reached a point where we can't know what we need to teach but for a year or two? Like, I mean, are, are the things that anybody is going to learn in any environment going to expire? And we have to continue to learn. So, but I think that, you know, going back to your first question on, on whose responsibility, I think those three things are definitely, you know, government needs to take the lead. Uh, and, you know, I have a background in government. I think government, you know, some governments are doing well, some governments are not doing that well. But then, you know, where, where companies come in certainly is in this idea that you have to be lifelong learners, especially in this economy. I have some ideas about how we could do lifelong learning, but I, I'll, I'll see what other people think. Well, we should come back to that, Richard. Yeah. I think that's a key point. You know, we've just seen in the UK now over 2,000 2, people lose their jobs in red car. You know, these are people without skills to go and move. They haven't got mobility to find another job. You know, what do we do about people like that? But I think we should come back to that because we, we've started a little bit on youth and, and youth unemployment there. And Yella, you talked about employee value proposition. Um, do you think we use that well enough to attract and, and give the right aspirations uh, to youth and to individuals? Well, I, I think that there is definitely room for improvement there. And um, in, in just hearing the, the, the comments uh, that, that you made, I think that it's, it, it almost comes down to rethinking what are the key ingredients of a successful learning experience. Um, and um, I couldn't stop but thinking of, a, of an article that was written by Herminia Ibarra. She's a, a professor of organizational behavior in INSEAD in saying eventually, when we look at what builds us as professionals, we can say that um, it's, it's a 70-20-10 rule. 70% uh, of who we are as professionals is the result of the critical experiences that we had in our jobs. The type of projects that we worked on, uh, the type of stretch assignments that we had that helped us to, to to develop beyond what was at a certain moment uh, our competencies and skills. 20% is the result of critical relationships that we have with other people in our professional environment. So connectivity, it comes back to that. 10% formal training ex cathedra training, which obviously coming from INSEAD, it's, it's pretty uh, bad news. But still, if we think of a learning experience as trying to reproduce these proportions and balancing that element of you know, the 10% the of theoretical learning with some on-the-job experience and some critical mentoring, probably this is the winning combination. Yeah. See, it's interesting that I would, I would say that, I mean, I think that's fascinating research, but I would say, that that percentage is probably different depending upon who you are and what you bring to your life experience, and uh, and for better or for worse, uh, what you you know what you bring into life and how you got here and where you live and what your socioeconomic condition is. I mean, we struggle um, in the United States when I'm you know on on the at these board meetings of of the university I'm part of. We struggle. I mean, I, I personally think that we need to have more vocational education in the United States. And I, I personally think that the, 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 the groundbreaking work they're doing in Germany, especially around this, is, is very important. But yet, educators say to me, they say, well, how can you put somebody, how can you put anybody into a vocational track? How can you deny them this opportunity to experience uh, these critical learning skills? Uh, uh, once you, you know, once you track somebody, to be a plumber, does that mean they're never going to be a university professor? And what does that mean for their career? But you have to balance it with the fact that, I mean, if you send someone to a liberal arts college in the United States and they graduate and they decide they want to be a plumber but they have $100,000 U.S. in college debt, I mean, what favors have you done for them? And that's where we need to be educating the students young about what they're good at and where they can go. And I don't know, I pay my plumber a lot more than I pay my, uh, <laughs> than I pay other professionals. Yeah, you finish that sentence, be careful. Than <laughs> <laughs> I, I pay some other professionals. <laughs> because there's so few of them. But I, I think getting, to, getting to, to kids when they're young, getting to their parents, understanding what people are good at, what they want to do, 
we, if we force children to finish high school on a college track and they don't want to go there, college dropouts happen. People say, I'll drop out, I'll start my own business, I'll do things. Our dropout rate is way too high around the world, but particularly in the States. And then, then you're all off track. So let's give up on the dream. Mm -hmm. Make a different dream. Nancy, would you be optimistic about, I don't know how much you've seen around what they're calling emotional um, uh, intelligence and, uh, well, uh, you know, EAI, I suppose, if you like, where we can essentially profile people uh, based around their emotions and their reactions to things and then equip them with learning programs yes. that match that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would set a lot of store by that. Because yeah. I think the way we learn now is, you know, we talk about this trend of liquid skills a lot. You know, it, it's true. If you are going to do a technical job, be it a plumber or a programmer, you need a lot of technical skills. Most of the time, most of us just need enough uh, savoir faire to get in the front door and you learn a lot once you're, once you're there. And so skills are things that you sort of plug in and throw away as and when yes. you need them. And I think what we're seeing is people are doing that for themselves on the internet through peer networks. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm, I suppose, charmed by are the number of businesses that are actually looking at that you know, huge diversity in coursework and saying, okay, well, we'll take that in, we'll match that up with you know, how you are, how you behave, and not so much about what you actually have to do in your day job. And then, and then channel that appropriately, because I think that's a huge amount of energy to have to harness. And I think we, we can do that in, in a way more intelligent way than we have done I today. I totally agree. Totally agree. So, so, Tim, from the educator's point, from the university point of view, um, what, what would your reaction be to those comments there? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of new universities, particularly some of the newer universities, are experimenting with new models to make um, learning much more authentic, much more connected to real life issues. So we have quite a spread and range of approaches within the university and education space. Um, and to link back to the earlier point about um, whose responsibility it is, I think it's a great example in the UK um, around this in degree apprenticeships. And I think mm -hmm. this is a great example where the government has played a role to, to create a scheme, to fund a scheme, possibly via employer levies, but you know, they've set the infrastructure in place. They've said that in groups of employers need to come together to work out what it is that is required. And then they've got universities and other education providers there to work with them in collaboration. And that, to me, is exactly the right sort of model. And if these things emerge as things that are important and necessary, then they should get built into the learning experience. And of course, how do universities need to adapt? They need to change their talent pool. They need to have people who know about these things, who can facilitate these sorts of learning experiences. And that may mean hiring a completely different group of people, because universities have the same issues that big companies have. They don't have the right skills, and they need to adjust who they recruit, how they train, how they develop their staff in order to fulfill their purpose. Can I, can I ask you, so do you, are you, have you experimented with shorter shorter degrees, allowing people to get degrees in a short amount of time or allowing people to get certificates and things rather so, than... So there's a, whole, there's a whole variety of things there. First of all, just, just compressing the time. So this ludicrous idea that you have this huge summer break when historically you went and helped on the farm or whatever it was, you know, is not particularly relevant. So one of the things we do in an undergraduate level here, we do two-year degrees. And we don't do that by speaking faster. We simply work to a business calendar yeah, so people have got four, four weeks off a year as opposed to 24 weeks Your off a year. Your students must hate you. They love it. <laughs> they love it because the, the funding for them and the maintenance costs are dramatically reduced and it allows them to accelerate their progress into the, the workplace. We don't insist on that. We have, we have mo um, longer term models. But we also, you're quite right, we need to create smaller units of education that deal with specific issues. So you know, we're serving the professions um, like accountancy and marketing mm -hmm. and so on. But all these professionals need to know something about digital technology. Mm -hmm. They need secondary qualifications in leadership and management. So we need to be able to offer people various packages of education. And, and I think there is a role for formal education. And hopefully there is, because that's my job. But um, I, I think it's fantastic if you can create peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. learning. And I think it's fantastic to try to replicate these sort of professional environments. But I think there is something about giving people a package of formal education that's mm -hmm. formally assessed, that they can point to as mm -hmm. evidence that they know something about a particular topic or they have a particular skill. And, and we think that you know, that is something that will really serve people mm -hmm. to set them up for careers for the future. You know, I would just say the other interesting thing about this is, is that uh, you know, there is this also this bigger idea 
that some people don't really need a formal education. And I wonder what Nancy would do, like if, if, if someone came to you and said, uh, well, you know, I, I only, only got a two-year degree, but I don't think I need a four-year degree from a fancy school <laughs> to work at EY. I know that our, our CEO at, at GLG, uh, I, ho I hope he won't mind my saying this publicly, but he, he doesn't like to hire people who have MBAs because he thinks it's not a particularly useful degree. Um, and, and, and occasionally I will bring him a candidate uh, who's, who is a candidate for a senior position who has not attended college in the United States. It's very rare for someone to be a senior executive uh, you know, who's looking to make a job change and has not attended college. But he is particularly interested in those people because if they've succeeded without really finishing college, there's something very unique about them. Yeah, we do hire people without college degrees, but not directly entry level. Right. If they're coming in, it's they've proven themselves some other way, um, and we can get comfortable with that. We really look for um, hunger more than anything else when we're recruiting. Uh, we don't necessarily go with the, with the Ivies, the top schools. Um, we look for a variety of schools, hundreds of universities that we look at, and, and there's different criteria, and we look for value fit, and we look for teaming experience, and people who, who lead in how we define leadership. So we're, we're not looking for that top grade, top university um, pedigree. We're looking for, for fit and hunger. So this is part of the EQI stuff that you were, you were talking about earlier, Maeve, isn't it? Well, I think Attitude so. and behavior being right. I think we'll all become more aware of um, just how important that is to us. You know, I think, I think it, is, it really is a, uh, in this age of social media, you know, who we are and what we want to be is so important. And it's the first thing that we put out there about ourselves. And our job is an intrinsic part of that. Um, and if you can, you know, talk about your job and your identity in a way that doesn't just encompass like the literal day job, then that's a that's a significant bonus to your confidence, to your reputation, to the networks you're likely to connect with. Um, you know, I think it, it's a serious uh, success indicator. I, I was going to ask everybody whether they subscribe to this principle that we essentially advised, we did a project recently for the marketing and um, uh, creative industries uh, around in 2025, how will, how will the marketeer of the future use creative agencies? Um, so very specifically in the, in the advertising world, which I don't know if anyone is interested or knows anything about that world, but is under serious, serious pressure. Uh, big data is solving a lot of the problems and media agencies are putting a lot of pressure on the margins of you know, what was the old creative cachet. And one of the suggestions that we made very strongly to them is, you know, well, first of all, the thing you need to do is probably disintegrate your creative department that you sell yourselves on so uniquely. Because first of all, everyone can be creative. You don't just have one God-given creative director that should dictate the rest of the agency. But also, crucially, you know, creativity doesn't work in isolation. So, you know, instead of thinking of different departments in an organization, and I'm thinking of, uh, of Aniela's point here about structure, you know, bring in people from different departments, all with different disciplines, and put them in a room together and have them network a solution. So you put people who are good at um, cells uh, along with thinkers, along with strategists, along with creatives, and, and, and make that. Do you guys have experience of that? Because, you know, certainly um, people get very nervous about attempting that. But, but most people think that, um, yeah, I, in an ideal world, that's exactly what I'd like to do. You must see that with cross-functional teams in, in your organization, all, all the time. globally uh, and virtual as well, I should think. Yeah, all the time. And the more we can let people loose and let them try different things. You know, a couple of years ago, we, we were finding that people that we hired that had come from the military were doing quite well with us. And... And so we thought, well, it must be because they're very disciplined and hardworking. And so we went and studied those from the military and what, what it was about them. There was one thing that um, came out that they're very comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. Right? And that characteristic, we said, you know what, that's a great characteristic in our business. And putting people on these cross-functional teams where you, you're not the creative person, but you need to be creative, I think is, it's just so valuable, and, well, and, and people used, like it much more. They're used to changing jobs, too, right? They're used to Change. adapting yeah, and changing adapting. jobs. And I, you know, I remember when I was in school, 
there were a few visionaries who said, you know, you won't have the same, you, you know, this is, it'll be a new economy, you won't have the same job. I went to law school and I thought I'd go practice law and be a lawyer the rest of my life. And, and people said no, they said you're gonna do this for a little while, you're gonna go do something else, and, I, you know, but, and it's true. I think if we want to harness some of the millennial ambitions that are out there that are all bound up in starting their own business, which is never going to happen, I think that diversity has to be brought in. But sorry, Agnella, you yeah. were... So, so talking about lifelong experience and some of the very, uh, again, very concrete examples that we have seen, uh, in one of the major Swiss financial institutions six years ago, um, they were feeling that um, their talent pipeline was very slow in changing, in renewing. People stayed for just too long um, in, in their positions. They wanted also to change the gender composition uh, of, of that particular part of their business. So they said, well, we will start now with a new rule. Everybody needs to reapply for their position and they can keep that position for four years. And after four years, everybody needs to reapply for their positions. It was horrendous for the organization. <laughs> it was as disruptive as, and as hated as you can think it was. But what happened is that it created this sense in the organization that obviously um, those people were valued employees for the organization, but they needed to keep being valued employees right. for Creates the organization. A right? Create a lot of innovation. Think that nothing is actually achieved forever that they will have on a very regular basis to renew their skill sets, to keep up with the change in the workforce, to keep up with the fact that some organizations have now five different generations in their workforce that they Absolutely. need to, to manage across. Yeah. It's, it's simply unthinkable. Yeah. So um, now, so they went once through that, it was horrendous. Everybody said, well, they talked for half a year how, how horrible it was. And the next, re, the next process um, needs to, to happen next year. Guess what? Everybody in the organization is talking about, so what is the position that I would like to, to apply for? So it is very uncomfortable to start with because it challenges a status, a status quo. You are in this position, it's your position, you don't have necessary to make any proactive efforts to keep that position. It challenged that status quo, it created a different mindset and people feel even more empowered and in control of their own careers because of this, uh, of this process. And they live with the change. They get ready and they get excited by change. Exactly. Not, not negative exactly. change. And they didn't like it in the first place. I want to so, oh, ask, ask you a question. Go ahead. Because you, because you have, I mean, you, you, you have a, an amazing background for this panel. I'm, I'm surprised that we, you know, we've done this for, for a little bit, for half an hour, and I, when I was thinking about this panel, I thought, well, everybody's going to talk about technology, right? Everybody's going to say that the answer to, to all of these problems is that everybody needs to just learn about technology. You know, you could say we should all, we should all, everybody should just go to school and learn about technology, and then and the problem would mostly be solved, right? So do you, do you don't think that's true? People don't think that's true? No, I, I, I certainly don't think so. If I look around Europe, um but it's over 20% of youth are still unemployed. You look at many of the countries around Europe. It's because they're not learning about technology. <laughs> well, or are they getting the opportunity to learn full stop? Um, they're coming out, they, these are good, you know, they, they've got high aspirations. Youth coming out of, out of high school, they've got high aspirations to work. They want to work. Give them the chance and they'll succeed. To your point, Maeve, I think um, you know, too many of them think they can do it on their own. They can build up their startup businesses. It, ain't, it isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen. So it's up to companies like EY and other companies we work with that make a better proposition to say, come and join us. We'll continue to, to help you uh, to develop your skills. You look at diversity, you look at trying to get uh, females into the workforce and promotion through the organization. How many organizations shut the door in the adverts they put out, uh, the job prospects they put out, the lack of a good uh, EVP um, that just actually discourages female from females from even joining it. You know, the oil and gas industry is, is, is famous for this. Engineering has been famous for this in the past. You know, we are developing STEM skills within our education system, then we're closing doors on people, and we're just not creating that environment uh, of continual learning, is, is my thinking on this one, Richard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that hits some of the Aniela's point. I think you were probably talking about Ricardo Semler, I think, 
and some of his background there when you were talking. Right. And just because you mentioned the oil and gas industry, because we are talking about education and how in some cases it's not only educating the workforce and our own leaders, but it's also educating our, our clients about the diversity <coughs> of our own workforce. And because you are talking about the oil and gas industry, um, we work with um, um, the world's leader in um, equipment for drilling for, for oil. Um, and uh, very recently, so that was three months ago, uh, they had a female engineer that was assigned for a project in the Middle East, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, to lead a major implementation project uh, for a client there. So the client said, I will not have a female engineer come and implement this and work on my premises. And for the first time in the history of this very respected and very well respectable French-based company, the senior leader in the organization said, well, if you are not ready to accept this person, unfortunately, we will not be able to serve you. Because we choose this person because she is the best and she has the best qualifications to implement this project for you. And you know, the story gets even better because the client was quite enlightened and uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm ready to play the game. And this project's been, been long enough so that the clients get to be accustomed uh, with people that work with them. Uh, it was a success. And at the end of the project, he said, well, I will never challenge uh, this kind of decisions that are coming from our suppliers again. I will trust you that you indeed bring us the best people for the job, irrespective of their gender um, or uh, of, of their mm -hmm. background. So I think that it's also having that courage. This probably wouldn't have happened two years ago in the company. The company would have found different mm -hmm. solutions, different alternatives. But it's also this courage to say, well, no, I mean, these are one of the values that we are standing for. And uh, we, we really bring the best people for the job and you have to go. And, and I'll twist some of this back, if I may, back to, to employment, and I'll bring Tim and uh, uh, yourself back in on this one, Richard, because you know, are our educators being measured on output? So um, are you, in your role with the, the New York University there, uh, with your open university, now BPP, are you measured on output, what you're producing? Are you being held to account for that? Should you be held to account for that? Well, there's a raft of metrics within the world of education, and I think probably none of them are perfect. Um, no, but I, employers, I mean, those that are looking to employ people. Sorry, in, in what sense? So are employers holding you to account because you're not producing the skills that are required by employers today? No, I mean, I think there's obviously a general dissatisfaction amongst employers that graduates don't have the, even the foundation literacies, let alone some of the sort of higher level skills and so on. But the extent to which that is very specifically identified with particular institutions... Um, I would say no. Um, so I think you know, it would be good if that was a much stronger relationship. I think very often what I notice is that employers and universities don't really connect particularly at all. I mean, there was a fabulous example. I attended a Deans of Business School meeting held in the Bloomberg offices in, in London, and you could almost feel that these were two completely different species that had been brought together. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, on, on every level, they, 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 they dressed differently, they spoke differently, they thought differently, they both utterly despised one another. And, and it, <laughs> it, it, it was terrible, because that should be the natural place mm -hmm. that university business school deans would feel very comfortable yeah, in a modern technology company in a major mega city. But there were a lot of complaints that actually we should be out in some sort of campus somewhere in a more academic community and so on. So one of the problems is that there is not this connection that there needs to be. It's very, very important that educators and employers are meeting much more regularly, talking collaboratively about how to solve these problems. And it is an exchange, you're absolutely right. And we should be giving more insight into what young people are like, what they value, what they're good at, what they're bad at, what they need more help with. And we need to build programs together to bring out the development. And that for me is what the degree apprenticeship is, is hopefully gonna do. I, I mean, I, I definitely think, I, I think that uh, government uh, in, the, in the institutions of public education need to be held accountable. I think they have a huge role to play. I mean, I think business has a huge role to play, too. Uh, once people get out of school in, in terms of, you know, ongoing learning. But um, we didn't, we, you, I didn't know you were going to ask me that question, but I made a list of, of, of things, <laughs> of, of ways in which I think public education has to be held accountable. And I think 
the first one is I'm a strong believer in more tech, tech literacy. I think we have to teach more technology. I think, number two, that we have to be better at, te at teaching basic skills. We have to teach technology, but we also have to teach everybody the basic skills they need to do whatever they want. Uh, we're trying to do such a lot as, of that. Such as basic Well, skills. such as uh, basic communication skills. I mean, okay. I'm talking about, about how, to, how to write an essay, okay. how to write a business report. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people who are graduating from institutions of higher learning who can't really write in a, in a business community. Um, I think that uh, public education must have some form of apprenticeship or peer-to-peer -peer learning. At, in, in, in the New York State University system now, every student, no one can graduate without one, at least one experience in peer-to-peer or applied learning, they call it. And that, that's brand new. We're doing that for the first time. The fourth, the fourth thing um, was I think that we need to offer more shorter education, right? I think there need to be certificate-based education. I think we need to uh, do two-year schools. Some people may need one-year schools. I think we have to, have to end the idea that the only, you know, the only admirable, dignified, smart path that only that all smart people have to go to college for, for three or four years. I think we have to end that. That's a silly notion, and um, I think we have to do a lot more around mentorships. I think we have to create these partnerships with business. And I too am a big believer that we need uh, diversity and inclusion. Diversity and, cl and inclusion ideas need to infuse all of this, all yeah. of these yeah. ideas. Excellent, excellent, Tyson. Awesome. You want to jump in, Nancy? Yeah, so there's a phrase that I really like that says a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And <laughs> what. Um, I think Rahm Emanuel said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it really works, and um, what we're seeing in the, in the U.S. university system is kids are graduating with a lot of debt. It's widely publicized, means students don't want to go to college or um, can't go to college. So the universities now are starting to come out with statistics on average starting salaries, and they're starting to measure themselves against um, other universities and percentage of students who got jobs and then what the average pay is. And I also sit on the board of, of university where I graduated, and I know all of a sudden it's really been the last 12 months because before then it was, no, we are here to educate and we won't be talking about money. We're here to educate and, to, and teach kids to think, not to get jobs. And it's really changed a lot. Yeah. And it has really given us the opportunity as an employer to talk with universities on, we will hire your students if. And two times, two things I can think of, we talked to a bunch of universities about changing the calendar so that we could facilitate more internships. Mm -hmm. Doing a lot of internships when there's no work going on in our business isn't that great. So talk about doing February, March. The other thing we've done is um, if you don't have more women in your business schools, we're not coming there anymore. We're not coming to a class of 90% men. And we went to one of our biggest source schools and said, let's work on a three-year plan. If we can't get there, there's plenty of other schools to go to. When you have that kind did, of... I bet they did it. They did it. And it's, we, it's our responsibility. And by the way, the, peop, the partners who had gone to that university were absolutely freaked out. We can't go there and say that to them. But when you've, got, when you've got something behind it that you can really hold them accountable, but we can't say go do it. We said, we're going to help you. Let's have a partnership here, and here's, here's what needs to happen over the next three years. And it was awesome. And now the class is really nice and diverse. We're hiring a lot of people, and it really worked. Sometimes the partnerships can work beautifully and sometimes not so well. But if you're not having the conversations, it's, it's, it doesn't work. I would say that was a partnership where, where, where one side had the upper hand. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it worked so well. <laughs> yeah, but we were willing to put some muscle behind it also, yeah. and, and so it worked. So listen, we've had a, a, a lovely conversation here. Uh, perhaps I should open up for, for any questions for any of the panelists, please. most of the uh, afternoon talking about the 10%. The question is, how do you value the 70%? Well, this, those 70% are, as I mentioned, the stretch assignments, um, the P&L responsibility roles. All those roles that will make a person visible and will expose that person to critical experiences on the job. And very often what we see is that in organizations, the access to these hot jobs, to these career critical assignments, 
are the ultimate career accelerator because that will allow these people to be identified as top talents, therefore to get even more training, to get mentored, and even more exposure. So really the, the access to p and responsibility positions and to these stretch assignments, this is what constitutes that 70%. Thank you. And Nancy, can I build on that as well in terms of um, that exposure um, for new roles and things? Is that something EY look at? Uh? Yeah, we, we actually have a real discipline process around it. They say that um, the first two times you do something, it's exciting and you're learning, and the third time it's, it's work. And so we really try to, to give people different experiences, so much so that we're, we're process junkies. We, we actually have um, pieces of paper that say these are the experiences people should get in their first two years or next three years, and you can't get promoted unless you've had these experiences. So we, we get them through different things so that when they are ready to move to something else, they've had those exceptional experiences takes a lot of discipline because the last thing any boss wants to do is let their person do something different. Yeah. So it takes a lot of discipline. You've got to have a reward and penalties built in to make sure it happens. I think one of the things you can do around that is recognizing um, uh, different inputs from different people. So, you know, to Aniela's point, like not everybody's going to get a chance to sit in the hot seat, as it were, and, and go for that PL thing. And I'm interested in a lot of the experiments I see in different workplaces where effectively, uh, employers are either using uh, different social media tools to recognize people's inputs. So, you know, if an employee is prepared to like be super social about what the company is doing, or recognizing how people are living out, you mentioned, I think, purpose at the mm -hmm. beginning, um, living out the company's values in different ways, and how that perhaps signals them out to do other roles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think just recognizing all that makes up the, that diversity, and I don't mean the types of people coming in, I mean the types of outputs that you can gain from as a business would make a huge uh, difference and encourage people to go for other things like lifelong learning and continual innovation in themselves and investment in, in the actual business itself. It's exciting, it's motivating for them as an individual, isn't it? To want to do more. You'll be aware of, because it's all over the television at the moment, the, the Barclays uh, programme, uh, they're calling it Digital Eagles. So that's getting a lot of attention for all sorts of different reasons. But one of the unexpected benefits that they've got from that program was the number of people internally who were volunteering to be these right. digital eagles. So for anybody who hasn't seen this, it's you know people stepping outside of their comfort zone in the day job to essentially identify uh, people who are not so comfortable in branch with all of the new technology that they're using to essentially um, get people away from the counter and and and. Uh, handle their finances themselves so much more. So they're investing a lot of time and skills into educating their customer base, as it were. Um, but what they then found was that the people that signed up to conduct that program also wanted to be skills conduits for all sorts of other things. Do more. Um, and do more, and that led to um, different things, coding programs, it led to another highly public campaign about teaching uh, young people how to be socially media friendly uh, rather than embarrassing themselves about their um, own greatness uh, and uh, self claims on uh, Facebook, how they, how they could put this to, to more good, but also other internal benefits as well. So um, I think, you know, like Nancy said, if you're not having the conversation, if you're not even thinking about how to recognize different people's inputs and constantly give them new ways to try different things, um, yeah, there's there's a whole 70% of stuff that's that's kind of going unnoticed. And made quick recognition for that as well, isn't it? Because that's also what some of the millennials want. They want feedback immediately. Well, we don't want to be liked in society any longer. We want to be loved. If we haven't had 100 <laughs> Facebook lives, it didn't happen. So um, we there, there is no getting away from this. Our investment in our own egos is absolutely extraordinary. Um, I see this every day. I have far too many metrics to prove this. We We... Uh, self-edit uh, according to the popularity of what we've put out in the public space. So um, recognition <laughs> and immediate recognition is a serious yeah. motivator, yeah. You heard it here, you all ought to be Facebook liking this panel <laughs> on your on your We'll be watching on your phones, right? If we haven't had We're 50 LinkedIn the connections, then yeah. <laughs> we got another, the, sorry Nancy, go on, we got another question. 70, I'll, I'll be real quick, the 70% experience fact is what's so concerning about youth unemployment today. Because if you're not working, you're not getting those experiences. So That's not true. to be a downer, mm -hmm. but we've got to get these kids to work, to work. these young lost, adults. Lost generation. Yes. Another question there, sorry. Hi there, uh, my name's Kate Lander and I'm Managing Director for Europe for Fitch Learning. Um, 
I guess the question is almost tying it back to where I actually started the day today, which was in the women's breakfast meeting um, at the beginning of the day. And, and I guess it's a, a question probably for, for Nancy, but also others as employers. And this engaging with that next generation, you talk about the partnership with the university and stuff. Have those messages encompassed or tried to change the gender balance and diversity balance as well? Because it kind of seems as if there's that perfect opportunity to, to tie the two up and that, that expectations. Um, as, a, as an ex-chartered accountant at well, you know, a similar organization to yours, um, you know, and, and we teach people like the CFA program where membership is a horrific 82% to 18% the wrong way. Um, is that part of the process to, to change that balance as well as getting these people into the workforce? Absolutely. Um, so absolutely, but I would say the businesses needed to change how we do business to be more attractive long term uh, for women around the world. And we've made leaps and bounds in a lot of countries, still some way to go in another. But if you're going to make a play to have a lot more women come in, you better make it a good place for them to be once they're there. I, I was one of the two blokes there this morning. <laughs> Um, I, I think one of the things we need is role models. Um, and I was partly disappointed by the conversation this morning because it's, it's some, repeating some of the stuff we've heard about uh, diversity and women in leadership for too often. I think we need to move on from those conversations, uh, create role models, uh, getting those into, into uh, primary schools, actually, I would recommend, to set those role models for people to have that aspiration to get into, in, into some of these roles. And I think work experience, for me, is another key thing. I'm involved in something in the UK called Movement to Work. We're trying to get 100,000 kids some work experience. Just expose them to what it's like to go, to go in at 9 o'clock in the morning to work for a full day. It might be stacking shelves or it might be sitting in an office. Um, getting exposure for that. And, and, and that's gender neutral for me. You know, that, and that's how we should operate now. Gender neutral, not trying to push and promote uh, constantly on one, one oh, side. Can I jump in? Oh, oh, sorry. I, think everybody wants to jump just, in. I just wanted to say on the diversity <laughs> issue, I mean, I think the diversity issue is, is great from a moral perspective, right, that we want, it, it, it's the right thing to do. But we should also, uh, you know, it should, we should make sure that we say, in this environment particularly, that it's also good for business, that, it's, that businesses succeed in, you know, they make more money exactly. in environments <laughs> that are diverse, and Nancy's company, UI, is, is part of this great uh, partnership called Open for Business that just released a report last week about uh, the LGBT uh, movement and LGBT rights in, uh, across the globe and how important that is for all businesses that are operating globally now uh, to realize that not everybody, while we've seen a great expansion in the UK and in the US on LGBT rights, that it is, remains a very important uh, issue that needs to be dealt with in many places. So I wanted to add that and thank Nancy for all the great work EY is doing on that. Did you have a follow-up question there? Sorry. Um, I think it just goes back to the point about dealing, dealing with children. Um, I think um, Sweden is, is a very interesting example of this where um, at Swedish schools there's no boys and girls sports. Um, all sports are done equally by boys and girls. Um, and if you look at their success in golf, as an example, um, it, it's very evident that it's not stereotyped as a boys' sport. And actually, they've got probably more female professional golfers than, right. they, than they have guys. Excellent comment. I wanted to jump in at the opposite end of the scale. So I totally take your point about if we don't get more young females through and you know uh, applying and, and uh, thinking in gender neutral ways, then that's a huge issue. I think the other huge issue we have to the point about skills and life learning is we're losing a lot of women halfway through their careers. So you know the uh, the, the drop off the cliff where your job starts to become a serious point of stress and where you're not prepared to reinvest in yourself is after you've had a second child. And unless we can, and let's, you know, that could be fixed really, really easily if employers were prepared to provide that sort of learning environment inside the day job rather than expecting that to happen in extracurricular time. Because the one thing we aren't going to fix quickly is the structural environment whereby women still, by far, have all of the onus at home for all the unpaid um, hours. And men are, that's changing, uh, and it's changing quite quickly. But that will take at least another two generations. So employers could actually fix a lot of that gender balance simply by um, working around the realities of what women's lives actually are. And that's a really fast win, as well as the things that you're calling out. 
Maybe just, just one, one thought Anyone. when it comes to that, because when, when we think about, again, educating you know, the workforce, we tend to think of what is that we can do to help women understand how their career will look like in traditional male industries. But at the same time, we don't have to forget also to train men in how to go towards the roles that were not traditionally male roles. So, you know, right. allowing, uh, transforming the organizations so in, in such a way that the breadwinner, the caregiver, gender straitjacket is no longer in place. And then the experiences can be more individual rather than stereotypical. But we don't have to forget that. So we are focusing a lot of getting women on the breadwinner uh, track. But at the same time, we need to make all the efforts to get men on the caregiver track, well. which yeah. is what the Nordic countries have done in yeah. addition to that, which makes the success of, it, of, of the That's model. Yeah, I just make one point on this, I think. I mean, I know that gender is a very big issue and we support it very much at BBB University, but for me, diversity goes way beyond any of the protected characteristics. And the really successful employers are the ones who are going to be able to bring people together with all kinds of different approaches and perspectives and thinking patterns which may have nothing to do with any of the protected characteristics but but to be comfortable working with extreme differences that's going to foster innovation that's going to drive business performance and I, I'm, I'm keen that the whole diversity agenda really moves moves forward into that space because that's what we really need to get into thanks Tim I'm going to take one more question hi uh, John Sybil from UBS um, I'm interested to hear probably from Nancy but equally from, from anybody about what you do to find, encourage and support social entrepreneurs um, and also how, how maybe you approach that from the, from the diversity angle as well. We do a lot around entrepreneurism. Um, we support all, all kinds of entrepreneurism, uh, social as well as, as commercial. Uh, one of the things we're doing is working with Nifty and so we're, we're working with youth entrepreneurs um, and that's incredibly rewarding. We have our young people in offices around the world uh, teaming up and, and providing counseling and advice and mentoring to these businesses and, and we help um, introduce them to finance sources. Sorry, I was meaning more from more entrepreneurs, so people working within EMY that want to do the commercial good for the organization um, as well as social good. That's our corporate response. Like within, within our organization, corporate responsibility-wise? But more, more the sort of, you know, sort of staff who want to maybe you know, introduce new products and services that commercially make sense for the organization, but also have the social good angle. That's a really good question. And obviously, I can't eloquently talk about what we're doing, sure. um, as, as evidenced by my not talking about it eloquently. The example I just gave is a great example of what you're doing yeah. in this area. Yeah, but we do a lot. We can't talk about it well. Um, we're just launching a lot of innovation campaigns so that we can start to surface these ideas and understand how what we're doing. We have lots of great practices around the world. We're, we're not organized yet around what we're doing. It's encouraged, but we need to do more work, and, and you could be part of our business case for investing in it. Absolutely. Thank you for asking <laughs> that. No Thank you very much. Can I firstly thank, uh, thank everyone the panel here today. I think excellent discussion. Thank Thanks for the, thank really you. quite thank enjoyed you. that as well. But thank you for listening. Thank as well. you.